Hi, everyone. Welcome to my live event for essential, essential vegan desserts at Ruby, Ruby Plants. This is the plant side of Ruby. And I'm very happy to welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days or nights. I know we have people all over the place. And so wherever you are, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about Earth Day. I think that Earth Day, we, I think of it as every day I really care about the Earth and sustainability, and we're going to jump right in. But what I want to say to everyone is wear sunscreen. I'm in Philadelphia, as some of you know, and we're starting to have spring that feels like summer. I don't think it will last but we've had almost 80 degrees and um, got my hat, got my sunscreen, which we know we're supposed to wear every day. For people who are going to be doing Passover that starts next week on Monday, I want to um, wish you a happy Passover. I know this year is a little, is different, um, but I've got my, you know, I've got some recipes on my website for chocolate covered matzah and things like that. I also just want to note that if anyone here is in Philly or the general area, I'm going to be doing an event, a class at Drexel on May 21st. So if anyone's around, just send an email to me at franruby.com and I will send you the information. And speaking of that email, I hope to answer everyone's questions today. If I get stuck, I'll get back to you. But if anyone wants to reach out to me, you can find me at fran at ruby.com. For essential vegan dessert students who are in the course, have graduated, or are thinking of trying, if you have questions of a technical nature, write to support at ruby.com. In fact, everyone can do that as well. And they'll get you right straightened out. So Earth Day, and I don't know when Earth Day was started officially, but it is April 22nd. And it really does provide a good opportunity to celebrate and advocate for sustainable plant-based living and that would include our meal choices our food choices and i do think that a lovely vegan dessert is part of our food choice so i want to talk about how they this can be made more sustainable and if anyone has any ideas of their own you can put your idea in the chat on the right side of your screen. There's a Q&A. And if you have a question, that's where you put it. Or if you just have a comment or a suggestion, you can put that there as well. So when I think about it, I'm going to focus on desserts because, well, this I am the director of vegan pastry at the Ruby Online Culinary School. And um, I co-created with Ruby Chefs the Essential Vegan Desserts course, and I am the lead instructor. I am the instructor for the course. So, of course, I'm going to be talking about vegan desserts. What comes to my mind is for sustainability, for Earth Day, which to me just means caring for the Earth. And by caring for the Earth, we're caring for each other and the animals and the plants we need to do that want to eat a plant-based diet at least a few times a week or every day i've been eating a plant-based diet a vegan diet for over 30 years another thing that i am aware of and keep in my consciousness is to watch the amount of water 
that I use. Now, because I do a lot of cooking, I clean beans, I soak beans, I clean vegetables, I wash them in lots of water. I think about the amount of water that I use. So I use what I call gray water. Now, <laughs> this is one of my many water bottles. And over here is another one. And you can see this one is transparent. There's some water in here. Well, I didn't finish. <laughs> I didn't finish drinking my water in those two bottles. And what I do is I hold on to that water and I use it to water my plants. Right now, that would be my indoor plants, but I do have a terrace and I will be planting a vegetable and flower garden as soon as I can. When I have washed and soaked my beans, and for most beans, I cook them in fresh water, not all beans. Uh, some are cooked in the soaking water, but if I have drained the beans or drained soaked nuts, for example, I hold on to that water and I use that to water my plants as well. Um, my father, his name was Sonny, and my father was 6'2", so that's quite a nickname for Sonny. But I grew up in a home where Sonny said, when not in use, turn off the juice, and that means lights. Now, I happen to feel best in an environment that is bright, and I'm lucky that my apartment is bright. However, I'm very conscious about turning off the lights. In terms of food choices, I think if you think if you consider shopping at your local's farmer market, farmers market, if that's available to you, or um, there are so many vendors like that, and there are there are companies like Misfits, where you can <clears throat> excuse me cut out the middleman and get really fresh seasonal produce. Um, I also, when I do shop in a supermarket here, my main supermarket shop is at a store called Mom's Organic Market. Uh, this was not available to me when I lived in New York, but I really like the market. I shop sales. I shop sales. I mean, there's always kale. There's always, I happen to like collards a lot. I like to have my vegetables and my fruits ready to go in my fridge. And I sort and prep my fruits and vegetables as soon as I get home. That might mean washing some, and it might mean storing them in bags like this. I find this, this really helps the vegetables hold for a longer period of time. I also, um, my new refrigerator is a uh, honey. I'm not throwing out food. I go through my refrigerator regularly that what we talk about in essential vegan desserts and other courses at Ruby is FIFO, first in, first out. So you want to make sure that you've labeled your food, make a list so you know what you need to eat so that hopefully you're not wasting any food. You might want to consider also Ruby has a course called Waste Not, which is a really wonderful course. I personally choose organic, organically grown fruits and vegetables as often as possible. And what you can do and what I do is uh, the Environmental Working Group has a list they update it every year and it's called the dirty dozen and the clean 15 so i make sure to purchase the organic foods that are on the on the versions of the foods that are on the dirty dozen and i don't worry so much about the clean 15. now again because we're talking about we're going back to talking about desserts now you know want to think about energy energy use and so it's very important if you're baking to make sure that your oven is preheated properly i use a couple of oven thermometers in my ovens i have a ge cafe oven over there and i have a small oven here that bakes beautifully they both i bake 
on convection bake, which normally means a shorter period of time for baking. But I do test my recipes in conventional bake because not everyone has convention, convection. And so, you know, my oven will ping or a ding when to tell me that the oven is at temperature, but I know that it's not. So I preheat it. I allow enough time to preheat. I have everything prepared and then I bake. Um, definitely continue or start to use mise en place, which means getting everything together prepped. It will save you time. And then I think it saves money as well. Now, as pastry people, we do test recipes. And sometimes the result isn't what we intended. And I think about that. So if I have an idea for a new recipe or I'm making something from a trusted source, meaning I don't just go into the internet and Google, I don't know, some recipe and from somebody that I don't know with no logical reviews, I'm, I'm gonna pass that by, that people get in trouble there, I think. Um, but if I'm trying a recipe for the first time, I scale it down by a half, maybe even a quarter. If it's a cake, that means I might bake a couple of cupcakes to maintain the integrity of the recipe. And if it didn't work out, then I haven't wasted more ingredients than I needed to do. Uh, so you can try that. Definitely make, take detailed notes. I have a notebook next to my, on my counter where I jot things down. If you're not pleased with the result of your test or of some, maybe an assignment that you had that you just, it wasn't for you, think about what can be done. I had an interesting thing happen last week. Um, I had purchased two different brands of vegan cream cheese that I expected to be good. And I didn't care for the taste of either one. I just didn't care for the taste. These were perfectly good cream cheeses, however, and I didn't want to throw them away. I suppose I could have given them away, but it's hard for me to say, here, take this. I didn't like it. Why don't you have it? So I started thinking about what I could do with this cream cheese that didn't have a flavor that I cared for. And I thought, I'm going to try to make mascarpone. Now, mascarpone is like a sweetened Italian cream cheese. And depending on whose recipe or where the use it's going to be as firm as a cream cheese or it's going to be slightly softer. The only thing that I thought I needed to turn these cream cheeses and I combined them in my mixer was a sweetener and I have plenty of organic sugar so I didn't feel like I was wasting and some lemon juice. And I added the lemon juice cautiously. I added the sugar very cautiously and I really made something that tasted delicious to me. Will I make it again? Maybe, I will probably make it based on a cashew cream instead of a cream cheese because it will be cleaner. The ingredients will be cleaner, but it was really wonderful. So I was happy about that. If you have a cake that your, is not your favorite cake that you baked, or maybe you have some cake left over, you can always crumb it, you know, dry the crumbs in your oven, crumble them up and keep them in your freezer. And then you have the possibility of making a pressed cookie crumb or I want to show you, I actually made one of my neighbors, her name is Janet. I told her I was doing this event today and I said, and it's for Earth Day. And Janet said, well, make, make a make a dessert to show with dirt. And she didn't mean dirt. She meant cake dirt. So I don't know if you can really see this, but what I have here are actually cake crumbs that came right out of my freezer. I've got some chocolate ganache. I had a very small amount. Let me show you a very small amount. 
just enough for that plate. These are the cake crumbs that were in my freezer. They taste good. I mean, the thing is, you have to do some tasting. And then I had some of the mascarpone cream. I have a little bit of basil. No, this is not basil. It's rosemary. I don't like using garnishes on a plate that have nothing to do with the dessert. But I was thinking that if I made a pastry cream for this dessert for real, I might, or the ganache, I would infuse it with basil. And then I've got some mandarin wedges because I love mandarin oranges. I think for me, citrus is, well, it's not really year round except for lemons and limes. And that is not local, but I like citrus. And I had a couple of little edible flower pebbles, petals, and some, for crunch, some pistachios. I had very little pistachio left. So let me just show you. So this is, it's not very pretty, but this is cake that I had cut up. I took the ganache frosting off it and I went from there. And this was in my freezer. And this is the pastry cream, the vanilla bean pastry cream that's in the course. And I have some lemon zest on top of it because I think it's delicious as a lemon recipe as well. So that's, there you have, there you have that. In terms of zest, oh, here you go. If your citrus is not organic, you want to really wash it. If it's organic, you want to really wash it as well, but I dry it up and I zest. So for example, if I need some orange juice, and I will need orange juice, I'm making uh, orange bunch cake, then I would zest the fruit and then juice the fruit. But if, if I'm not going to be juicing the fruit or I'm using it for some other reason, I will still zest the citrus and wrap it in, I wrap it so that it doesn't get hard and then use it when I need it. But I don't want to waste the zest on a, you know, an organic piece of fruit. So that's something that I always do. Make sure that you, make sure that you take notes. Again, I saw a couple of, um, questions about that. And, you know, you can trick your eye. I think one of the things we can do to make sustainable desserts is to use bigger plates. This is a large plate and I picked it because I love the little bees on this plate. Sometimes I use this um, on Instagram and, and oftentimes people will say to me, oh, hey, Fran, that, there's a bee on your plate. <laughs> but it is a cute little plate that I picked up in Bucks County. So you can use a smaller plate. I mean, I think the idea of larger plates for plating and we eat with our eyes is very nice, but we can also use a smaller plate and trick the plate, trick the plate out and definitely clean up as you go along. So now I'm going to move things around here and get back to the event questions so that I can start answering questions for you. All righty. Jane B has a very interesting question. So Jan, uh, Jane says, I've made Brenda Davis's black bean brownie recipe that you shared. I started using a scale to measure ingredients. Very good. To me, there is a huge discrepancy between three tablespoons of hemp seeds and the weighted. Okay, Jane. First of all, I think that you mean Visanto Molina. Visanto Molina did an event with me about protein, and Visanto and Brenda are writing partners. And in the event doc, for that particular event, we had two recipes posted from her from their book, 
which was is called uh, plant powered protein, I believe. And so I'm uh, guessing that you mean that you mean the cookie, the chocolate cookie, because there is no black bean brownie recipe that is made with hemp seeds. But you bring up a very important point. Now, I use scales, and many of you know that. Here's one of my scales. This one has several functions. It has fluid ounce, ounce, gram, and milliliter. And this one bounces between um, pound and kilogram. And then I have this little one for small quantities like agar, for example, which weighs very small. You want to make sure that your scales are calibrated, but don't you really, it's hard for me to say this, but it's true. You can't necessarily rely on a recipe, the, um, the quantities being exactly correct. Sometimes there are errors. And, you know, oftentimes if you go to a cookbook author's website, there will be a tab that says errata because things get messed up sometimes between the book and publication. Also, if you look at several different websites or books that list quantities, uh, tablespoon to... Uh, gram weight, for example, it's very surprising to me that there are variations. Now, let me just see. I'm moving off my mark, which I shouldn't do, but somewhere I know that there are differences. So in this case, Jane, you go ahead and measure your three tablespoons of hemp seeds. Note that in a notebook, and that is the weight. And I want every, I mean, I hope everyone measures or weighs things, uses a digital scale or two and make your own notes because there are differences, one brand to another. If we were all using King Arthur, all-purpose flour, and we whisked it because dry ingredients, they compact then it would be one thing, but it's really a good idea to do the weighing, weigh twice. Oftentimes I'll weigh a quantity twice and keep a notebook. So good luck with that. Antoinette is talking about almond milk. I used to make my own almond milk by stop because of the amount of water needed for almonds. Which plant-based milk would you recommend making and how to use the pulp? Well, Antoinette, any, you know, where we're making almond milk or you're making almond milk, for example, and then you're using this water to make the milk and we use, you know, there are basic formulas and you use more, uh, more water to make a thinner product and less water to make a thicker product. Uh, the manufacturers are doing the same thing. So all the plant milks are going to be made with water. But you're using that water, I assume, unless what you're asking me is about soaking the almonds first before you make the plant milk. If that's the case, use that gray water to water your plants or do some cleaning. Um, that's what I'd say. In terms of the pulp, I know that there are people who bake with the pulp. I dry pulp out and then toast it in my oven or bake it in my oven. And I add that to my oatmeal, sometimes assuming that it tastes good. Sometimes the skins are very tannic, but oftentimes not. I add it to oatmeal. I add it to some yogurt. So that's, you know, that's fine. That's fine. Don't worry about that. Jen says, we love decadent with all the fat and sugar, so I'm here for it. But do you have a recipe or suggestion for those times we need to trick ourselves into thinking we're indulging, but really not? Well, <laughs> Jen, you know, indulging, an indulgent dessert really depends on the eater, I would say. Um, you know, 
I happen to like very dark chocolate and I happen to like, and those of you who know me know that my portions of dessert are very small. They're, let me not say very small, but they're smaller than many. I mean, I look at the, uh, the muffins that I find in some of the shops and I go, oh my God, that's a cake for four people. So one thing you want to do is serve smaller portions, fill the plate or the dish out with fruit and use, you know, use that to trick your eye. In this course, we have decadent desserts. We have a vegan baked Alaska made with aquafaba meringue and some vegan ice cream and a cake or a cookie. Now, for example, that ice cream can be vegan ice cream that you make yourself or that you purchase, or it can be vegan ice cream that's known as nice cream, which has oftentimes a base of banana and other fruits and sometimes just fruit. So that would be a less fat and sugar situation. The vanilla cream that I referred to earlier in the course is a favorite and that is made the base recipe is made with some organic vegan cane sugar, but I have made it with whole pitted medjool dates, and that takes the sugar out of it. We also do have a number of recipes in the course for agar-based desserts, fruit-based desserts, and then there is no fat and there is no sugar. So it's up it's completely up to you, but there's plenty. When I have really discovered by talking to a lot of people and paying attention to myself, when you really want something, it's a good idea, some kind of treat. It's a good idea to have it because <laughs> you can eat all the carrots you want. You're still going to want that other treat. So what I do is I make smaller truffles, smaller portions, and I find that one, two bites is enough. So good luck with that, Jen. Therese is telling me that she lives in 7,000 feet elevation. So that's high altitude baking can be a challenge. It is indeed. And there is no one answer to that because I actually added a um, unit about this, about high high altitude baking to essential vegan desserts because we have, you know, students all over the country and all over the world. And this is a situation. I know that one of my daughter's friends lives in Wyoming, in Wyoming. And she told me that she made my chocolate cake to live for and that it came up out of the pan and spilled all over the oven for her. Um, I did a bunch of research and it's very it was very interesting to me to find that there are there really is no one answer there are microclimates so where you live one town over might require some different adjustments and i put just two links here i think i bob's red mill and king arthur both have very interesting information on high altitude baking i think the best information you can get is to go to um, universities and so here's one from colorado state so good luck with good luck with that it is doable it will take some trial and error for you hi regina so regina said is asking if i've ever used strawberry extract does it enhance strawberry flavor? She's working on a frosted strawberry cupcake for an outdoor market. Would you do cream cheese or buttercream frosting? Well, Regina, you're really moving along with your selling your baked goods. So congratulations on that. Um, I have never used strawberry extract, so I can't say if it enhances strawberry flavor or not. I would look at some and see what else, what other ingredients are in that extract to see if you're, if you like that or not. And in terms of um, cream cheese or buttercream frosting, that's entirely up to you. Either would work. 
you want to think about how they're going to hold up after you get the flavor right because it's an outdoor market. This, uh, it, these are freeze dried, no sugar added organic strawberries that sometimes I grind up and they are very flavorful. They really taste like strawberries. Um, I was thinking about strawberries last night. I think, I, oh, you know what it is? I heard Ruth Rachel talk about being, she's a, some of you may know she's a, a food writer. She was the editor of Gourmet for a number of years, and she's written a number of books. She has a new cookbook coming out, and she was talking about being in, I think, Santa Rosa, California, at a farm where with Alice Waters from Chez Panisse, and they came back on a plane with flats of these little, delicious little strawberries that are too fragile to ship. So I, I don't get those strawberries. I get strawberries for a short period of time from farms here in Philadelphia. And, you know, many of us are, have had strawberries that are big and inside they're white and they don't taste like strawberry at all. But when you get those other strawberries, they're just incredible. Well, strawberries are on the dirty dozen list. So this is a place where I do spend the money on buying organic freeze-dried strawberries. And when I keep, um, I keep them sealed very tight and when I grind them, I often grind them with a little bit of sugar so that it doesn't clump. So let us know how it goes, Regina. Um, Rosie wants to know any ideas, any recipe sources for buckwheat flour? What is important to add so the result is moist? Well, to get a moist result, Rosie, you're going to need, it's a lot more than the buckwheat flour. And mostly this is used in combination. Buckwheat has a strong flavor. So you want to add to a recipe that you already know works, start with adding maybe 20% buckwheat flour and see how that feels. And then if you like that, you can go up. The so Rosie has a couple of questions and I'm gonna go right through them. She says, I chop my herbs dry, yes. Then I wash them in a strainer and I'm assuming you pat them dry again. I put them in a salad, but there was no flavor. Too wet, too finely chopped, both. Well, it's a couple of things. I wouldn't put them in the salad wet. I would wash your, I wash my herbs, I dry my herbs, and then I chop them. If there is no flavor, then perhaps your herbs haven't got enough flavor. I mean, this smells like rosemary to me. I've got some thyme in the refrigerator that smells like thyme. So make sure that your herbs are dry. Make sure that they have a nice fragrance when you start. And if you're not tasting them, then add more. And Rosie is asking about when we boil, we ought to add an acid to help maintain the color of vegetables, I'm assuming. I don't do that. If we're steaming those types, would it help to add acid to the simmering water? I do not do that. I, I either boil my vegetable, depending on what kind of a hearty green it is, or I steam it. I take it out and I don't lose color. So I'm not having a problem with that. Um, Maybe you can give me some more information, Rosie. Diane K says, when I've used chia seeds in a recipe, it produces a grainy texture. I don't enjoy, though I like the thickening. I never use, oh, you know, I'm reading chia and I'm thinking flax. Um, I grind my chia seeds be, to make a gel or to put them in a recipe for the thickening. And then there's just no problem with that at all. So that's what I do. I don't use the whole seed unless I want some crunch, but I do grind the seeds. Keep I have ground flax and ground chia in my refrigerator labeled with when I ground them and that's what and that's what I do. So I think you'll you'll find that works. Melissa wants to know how 
I store my citrus zest. Uh, depends on if I know I'm going to use it in a day or two. I might just wrap it, put it in an airtight container and put it in my refrigerator. Otherwise, I store it in the freezer and take it out and use it when I need it. And it works really well, really well. My freezer right now has quite a lot of orange zest and lemon zest. I'm not the biggest fan necessarily of lime zest. I find it has to be very, I mean, I do zest things very fine. If I, yeah, I've got this load of oranges now, so I'm probably going to do some strips as well. Um, Rosie wants to know when stuffing mushrooms, small and large, is it better to remove the gills? That's personal, absolutely personal. I know people who re remove the gills from the underneath. I know people who even peel the mushrooms. I do not. I tend not to do that. And Rosie has another question here about buying vanilla extract. So I did a live event with my friend, Chef Kathy Gold, uh, who knows all about vanilla. And you can find that event in the live events library. And I suggest you listen to it because it was, there was so much information. So Rosie is saying what additives are okay. She saw one had organic glycerin. My preferred vanilla has nothing, but this is Halala vanilla, which honestly I didn't know about until Chef Kathy Gold talked about it at the event. And it's a wonderful vanilla. It's a wonderful vanilla company. It's women owned. It's um, really helping people out in the, new, in the Pacific communities. So this vanilla is vanilla bean extractives in water and alcohol and that's it and that's what it should be this is beanella this is all i have left but i decanted it and you can see that for the most part my jars are dark and this is twofold vanilla so i need less and this is a larger amount i like penzi's spices are one of the spice companies that i like and i was excited that they opened a brick and mortar in Philadelphia. I had actually never been in one before. I was very surprised to learn, to see with my own eyes. I went to get some look at their vanilla one day and they add sugar to their vanilla. And honestly, the uh, shop clerk, and they know a lot there, really, she had no idea why. Oh, here we go. So Kathy has answered. Glucose sugar helps the steeping process in commercial extract production. Hey, Lala has no sugar. Organic singing dog is sugar free. And that's another. Thank you, Kathy, for clarifying that. Singing dog is another wonderful vanilla that I use and tend to buy in quantity. So usually sugar is no more than 5%. Um, Diane wants to know, are there any Passover specific recipes that I'd care to share? Absolutely. Um, the easiest thing to do is to go to my website, francostigan.com, and you're going to find a recipe for chocolate covered matzah with za'atar, which is a spice blend that I absolutely love. I, I love the flavor, but not everybody's going to like that. So, you know, you can use something else. I also have um, coconut macaroon, macaroons, <laughs> not macaron, but macaroons. Uh, and I believe they're on my website too. Super easy to make and delicious. And, you know, does, when you're talking about a family celebration and holidays are oftentimes with family and friends, people want what they're used to, or my family does. So for example, baked Alaska, but not with a cake made with flour becomes a Passover dessert because then it's ice cream and meringue. And if, you know, the meringue, aquafaba meringue is made from chickpeas, not all Jewish people 
eat beans for Passover, we do. So there's something, uh, chocolate ganache, little mendiant, which are melted chocolate with some nuts and dried fruits dropped on are one make wonderful desserts too. And if you Google matzah crack, which has become a thing, it's absolutely delicious. So you set matzah onto a sheet pan and the recipe calls for butter and brown sugar. So it really caramelizes and then chocolate. Well, vegan butter, you got no problem there. So those are desserts that I like and I will probably be sending a newsletter out soon to, oh, you know, with some desserts. Oh, great. Antoinette has a follow-up. Yes. She was referring to the amount of water it takes to grow almonds, and that has become an issue. People are unhappy about the amount of water. It takes a lot of water to grow almonds. Cashews seem to take less water, oats as well. So I think, and I tend to use oat milk for all of my desserts now for two reasons. I like the flavor. I like oatly, the different kinds of oatly oat milk. And also, um, I don't have to worry about allergies. I don't have to worry about this person is allergic to nuts. So that leaves out almond milk, cashew milk, all the nut milks. This person is a soy avoider, which I am not. So that leaves out soy milk. Soy milk is great. And so that's what I like. Uh, Lily wants to know how long can you keep freeze dried cranberry powder? Well, I don't like to keep anything for, you know, ever and ever. <laughs> but I think if it's fresh and you keep it airtight, it's okay. You can keep it in the freezer. Uh, Ma says, I'm from Arizona. We like to harvest our mesquite flour. And again, moist. Oh, mesquite flour is delicious, but it's not the same. You know, just excuse me. I'm going to have to turn around. I'm having unbelievable allergies today. So um, actually, that means I'm going to be making myself some shiitake broth with daikon and kombu and sip that because I find that it really helps. So mesquite flour, mesquite is a very, has a very strong flavor. I love it. I've got some, I mean, I've visited Arizona and um, I'm going to be visiting Arizona in October. I think that's right. Yeah. So I've tasted breads and cakes made with the mesquite, but just a little bit, just a little bit. Suzanne wants to know how best to measure fresh herbs. For instance, the amount of fresh herbs can vary greatly. Yes, one tablespoon chopped fresh herbs versus one tablespoon not chopped herbs. Yeah, that is true. And so it depends on how you're using them. I've got over my shoulder, I think you can see I've got a jar of dill and a jar of parsley and i'm keeping them like flowers i keep adding ice cubes and then when i'm not doing a live event i've got a plastic bag over them and that holds it so if i'm not chopping my herbs i'll take a tablespoon but i'll eyeball it and throw it into the pot otherwise you know i'll chop them that's not it, unless you have a very strong herb it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, Antoinette said, I missed who just asked this question. I found out about this company, Genuine Essential Oils, Culinary Flavors. Uh, not all are vegan. Oh, that must be about the strawberries, I think. Melissa wants to know, what do you use to grind the chia seeds? I have a small coffee grinder that I use to grind flax and chia seeds and some other things and then wash it out really, really well. And um, I store, I mean, I don't make quantities like this when I'm grinding chia and flax, but I keep them in my refrigerator probably for a couple of weeks. My fridge holds nice and cold and the jar is absolutely clean that they're going into and tightly, tightly stored. This is a very important question from Suzanne. 
can you grind agar agar flakes to get agar powder? Seems like an easy answer, but I get conflicting information. You should not get conflicting information. The answer is absolutely not. You could grind agar flakes and perhaps powder them. But as we have a whole unit on using agar in essential vegan desserts course, it is an absolutely important critically important recipe uh, ingredient for making vegan desserts. And the difference between, there is a difference in thickening, in strength, that's what I mean, between the flakes and the powder. So there is a conversion that has to be done. So no, don't be grinding your agar flakes to get agar powder. It's one or the other, and you do the conversion, agar powder tends to be three to five times as strong as the same amount of flakes. And even that might vary company to company, which is why all throughout the course and every time I speak, I say, do a test. If you're, if you're making an agar gel or a you know, a lightly gelled fruit soup, for example, or a frosting that relies on agar. You do a test before you've, you've, you've finished cooking, but you don't pour it out and do the next step. You take a cup, a tablespoon, put it in your fridge for 10 minutes. And then look, if the agar gel is too soft for your intended use, then you will add more flakes or powder. And if it's too hard for your intended use, you're gonna add more liquid. So thank you for asking that question. That is really, really important. Um, Sandra says, I've seen recipes for cookies and other baked goods that call for flax seeds. What's the purpose? When cookies or baked goods have flax as an ingredient, it's being used as a binder. So probably cannot be left out. And Karen wants to know which is better, golden flax or brown flax. Um, I, I've read that the darker color has more benefit, but there is so much benefit in flax that I wouldn't worry about it too much. When I'm grinding flax and using it in a light color dessert, and I don't use a lot of flax in my desserts, actually. Um, I have every morning my bowl of oatmeal is blueberries this time of the year or in the wintertime, it's frozen. I get them defrosted, organic frozen blueberries, oatmeal, and then I have three lines on there ground chia, ground flax, and some cinnamon and that's my breakfast and sometimes some walnuts too so that's you know that's what i say that's what i say about that uh catherine wants to know what's the name of the organic vanilla extract one is halala and the other is singing dog halala is h-e-i-l-a-l-a -A, and the answer you know you can go back to these live events and you'll have a transcript and you'll be able to see. Uh, Kathy wrote, hey, Lala, vanilla extract has no sugar. Organic singing dog is sugar-free as well. Rhonda wants to know, do I prefer Penzi Zatar? I've never had it. Um, I have a jar of Zatar now that my daughter bought uh, at a farmer's market in Bucks County, but I make my own Zatar. There are so many different versions of Zatar. It's a mix. So you can make your own. Um, I can't answer about the Penzies because I haven't had it. I haven't had it. So it looks like all of the questions have been answered. And I want to thank you for those really good questions. They were wonderful. Um, I always learn from you and I want to thank you again for being here. Hope I'll see you in May. We have picked a topic so you can find it in the Ruby live event library. I hope everyone takes care 
of yourself, take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones, take care of one another, and think about eating and living sustainably because we're all in this together. Thank you very much for being here, everyone.